Okay, we're back. We're live. We're doing Community Matters today with Kevin News, and uh, we, we're going to discuss uh, about uh, appropriation, not necessarily as a legal thing, but misappropriation as a, a violation of artistic principles. Is that a correct statement of it, Kevin? Uh, well, uh, more generally uh, cultural, but um, art, art definitely comes into it. Um, uh, do you remember the good old days before COVID? Um, we used to get worried about things like cultural appropriation. So I'm, I'm trying to ease us back into um, something that resembles normal, where things like that really matter to people. And um, so um, I've been spending my, some of my time <laughs> um, whilst under lockdown uh, contemplating, well, you know, <laughs> what does cultural appropriation actually mean? And what is not cultural appropriation. Um, there's been a lot of um, uh, discussion of this probably in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, the issue for, for some is that um, it can't surely be that it's inappropriate um, for one culture to learn from another. That's one of the key drivers of human civilization. If, if, if it weren't for that, um, for example, uh, we got from China um, the compass, the clock, paper, gunpowder. What would we have done without gunpowder? No Nobel prizes. So, um, you know, so uh, you know, clearly, cult ideas migrate across cultural and national boundaries, and and often um, to the general betterment of civilization. So, so it surely, at least to me, can't be that, well, you know, there'll be no more cultural exchange. Then. So where's the line between legitimate kind of benign cultural exchange and something that is pernicious or, or damaging? And that's what I've been um, trying to figure out. So I came up with a theory that, and it's, uh, it's based on your discipline, not mine. So I'll blame you if it all goes south, Jay. Uh. It, it's the notion of, uh, the legal notion of, um, no harm, no foul. If nobody got damaged, then nobody should be held guilty. Um, and that's the kind of premise, if we go to the first slide then. Um, okay, so we're talking about infringement of a kind here. That's what we're talking about. Right, and uh, the two types of cultural harm, or at least harm then, that, that I considered were loss. You know, you can lose income, you can lose property, um, you could lose identity and um, offense, you know, um, somebody could just um, be harmed, you know, I, if I hurt your feelings, you are harmed, right? So, so two types of harm, psychological, and one is, is more sort of, um, well, not entirely tangible, if it's cultural, but something is lost, um, something um, necessarily important. Um, and that brings me to the second um, slide. The three criteria that I that I'd propose would be that the thing that is lost or taken without permission has to be significant. If it doesn't matter to anybody, then it doesn't matter to anybody. Um, it needs to be recognizable in its new context. And it needs to be taken by a dominant culture. I'll, I'll come to the second part, but the, the recognizability part, uh, Jay, if I were to steal your car, and I know that you've got a really nice car, and uh, you know, um, stripped it out, uh, changed the color, um, you know, put big stripes on it, um, kind of pimpy wheels, you know, all the rest of it, uh, to the point where, you know, I could park it outside of your house and you wouldn't recognize it. Would it still be yours? Would you have uh, a right to say that's my car? I don't, I don't have a really nice car. I <laughs> that's never fine. had a really nice car, but we can, well, we can continue this conversation anyway. Well, let's pretend that you had a nice car and I took it and, I mean, I legally, uh, even I know this much, um, it doesn't matter whether you can't recognize it anymore. You know, if I took it to a chop shop or whatever, it's still your car, right? It, uh, but there seems to be a significant fundamental difference between a material property or possession like that and a cultural possession where if I take something from your culture um, and change it such that you don't even recognize it, it's hard, I would argue, to claim that it still belongs to you or vice versa to me if you took it from me. If I walked past it and didn't even recognize it as mine, then when I learned that 
you did derive it from me, but you changed it so much, then I get offended. It seems somewhat, I don't know, fake. Um, if you don't even recognize your own thing, when it's not a material possession, then it seems to me that it's, it's tough to make the argument that it still belongs to you. So those are the, um, the premises, um, uh, Jay. Um, mm -hmm. So I looked at some examples and, um, that would not qualify under those criteria. Uh, in order to make some kind of a, uh, a useful distinction so that people uh, are not left in their current state where um, people will make accusations of cultural appropriation and it's hard to defend that. Right? When there's no criteria, there's no definition, in the end it starts to become very subjective. If somebody takes offense, then, you know, well, it must be cultural misappropriation. Then. And that's the other point that appropriation, of course, is not inherently bad. I believe Congress has an appropriations committee, and I'm sure they're up to all sorts of nefarious things, but that isn't automatic, right? So, so appropriation is a neutral word or was. Um, there's a perfectly good term for the abuse of appropriation, and that's misappropriation. So I prefer to use cultural misappropriation because I think some appropriations of other cultures are legitimate, and that will probably get me into trouble. But, um, but I'm trying to make that distinction so that people can have a... A decent conversation based on some sort of objective criteria rather than um, sort of subjective well I think it is and somebody else thinks it isn't. Well, which ones are uh, which ones are legitimate how would you define that Kevin? Well um, if if one of those criteria if we come up um, uh, if if the original form or idea wasn't significant or it isn't recognizable in its new context or it was adopted by a non-dominant culture from a dominant culture, then it seems to me that little harm, little or no harm is done. If one of those criteria is not met, right, um, it could be significant but unrecognizable, in which case, where's the offense? I mean, where's the harm? Where's the undermining of the culture? Um, it could be that it is significant and recognizable, but it came from the dominant culture. Usually dominant cultures like to project their their own image onto other cultures so you know usually they're not offended they're quite the opposite probably flattered um and if it's not significant as i said in its original context and then it gets adopted well if it wasn't significant to start with why does anybody need to be offended by its adoption somewhere else even if it is recognizable so those are the three criteria they're sort of they raise other questions, um, which which we'll we'll talk about. But um, let's go to um, image three, um, which is a couple. There, there are a couple of architectural plans. One is a a fairly ordinary um, traditional Japanese house plan, and one is a uh, a house plan designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, who we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And um, I believe that one is the second one it, on the right is based loosely on the one on the left. Although you would be hard pressed, and so would a Japanese, I think, to recognize that because in the three dimensional form, um, which is what you actually see in the real world, not the plan, um, it doesn't look remotely Japanese. So for two reasons, it's, it, that form was not particularly special, it wasn't culturally significant, and it was not recognizable. Um, it wouldn't qualify as cultural misappropriation by the criteria that I'm proposing. If we go to the next one, another architectural plan, and I'll I'll stop with the architectural plans after that. Um, uh, the, the plan on the left comes from Pergamon, an ancient uh, Hellenistic Greek um, city on what is now the, the, um, the coast of Turkey. And on the right, a modern library by the Finnish architect Alvar Alta. And again, I believe that he derived his plan from this ancient plan. Now, there aren't many Hellenistic Greeks left because you know most of them died a long time ago. <laughs> But even a contemporary Greek would have a hard time, again, recognizing that. So you could argue maybe it was significant, but it's really, to all intents, unrecognizable in its new context. So no harm, um, no foul, um, not misappropriation by, by my criteria anyway. And then if we go to the next one, um, and this will be, I think, uh, yeah, this is um, the way that uh, the two Japanese um, syllabaries, um, katagana on the left and hiragana on the right, were derived from Chinese characters in the middle. And uh, if you didn't know, um, 
as a Chinese, it would be hard to tell that the transformation is so great that it would be difficult to recognize your own text. So the source is clear when it's set out this way, but if you just showed um, a Japanese or a Chinese sort of, um, speaker or, or writer in this case, um, those Japanese forms unrecognizable. So in this case, there's no doubt that Chinese characters are deeply significant, but if they're unrecognizable in their new context, then it becomes a kind of, well, where's the harm? Um, um, and in this case, uh, in the sixth century, um, at that time, uh, China was the dominant culture and Japan was borrowing from China. So it doesn't qualify on two criteria, that it's not a dominant culture weakening a, um, a less or a, um, a minority culture. And, and the forms are not recognizable, even though they're significant, they're not recognizable in the new context. And then if we go to the next ones, we start to get into um, a kind of wool area. Um, this is the Emperor Meiji uh, dressed in full European imperial regalia. Um, and yes, it's, you know, at the time it would have been cultural significant um, uh, and instantly recognizable to most Europeans. Um, but uh, Japan was not the dominant culture. So where's the harm? You know, most Europeans at the time, I would suggest, would probably be flattered that, oh, Japan is becoming one of us. You know, that was the big, you know, to become... Um, a member of the uh, of, of the respectable democratic nations of the world, and um, you know, and you had to dress right to do that. It's like being a member of a club, right? So you know, the members of that club would 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 be flattered and approve that. Oh, you want you genuinely want to be a member of the club. So you know, there's no cultural undermining there. You know, European culture was perfectly fine. It was the dominant uh, culture of the time. So again, I, by these criteria, at least. Um, not cultural misappropriation. Suppose I, suppose I made fun. Suppose I, I, I dressed just like him, same kind of outfit mm -hmm. in, uh, in, a, in a parlor game in London somewhere, right. in the 19th century, and I intend to make fun. Um, now, is that, is that misappropriation? I'm, um, I'm, putting, I'm putting him down, you understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, you, I, I'd assume then that you would somehow have to dress yourself to look Japanese and that um, uh, I'm not sure if it's misappropriation but it's certainly offensive uh, so, so, <laughs> uh, um, uh, yes I suppose I mean uh, you know if 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 racial characteristics are part of culture then then it is you know it's obviously significant so yes it would be definitely Right. Well, maybe part of your definition is it has to be serious. Uh, um, I'll think about that. But I, I mean, I think, um, you know, your physiology as a race is, is, you know, is clearly important. It's clearly significant. I'm and talking, it, I'm not talking about the race part of it. I'm just talking right. about his outfit. Oh, I see. Well, his outfit came from Europe. So they would have been making fun of themselves. You know, if you think that looks ridiculous, most of the leaders of Europe dress like that. And I'm all for making fun of royalty anytime you want, but, but, but um, you know, but it wouldn't be unique to Japan, you know. Uh, like I say, bizarre dress like that, you know, um, 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 the uh, uh, the Kaiser, you know, the king, they all dress like that, you know. You so, can hardly tell the difference in the 19th century. They all exactly. had these outfits. Exactly, exactly. So it was. <coughs> and I might add that in the 20th and the 21st century. Uh, you had American military uniforms. These are military uniforms yep. that 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 were copied by everybody, right. and you can hardly tell the difference, um, you know, between an American military uniform and some developing country military uniform. I'm going to look into that, um. <laughs> I, but I, you know, I don't think anybody complained about it because it was, you know, what do they say uh, uh, is the Imitation is the most sincere uh, part of flattery. Yeah, they do say that. As long as they can tell the difference on the battlefield, I really don't mind, you know. <laughs> um, so if we go to the next image. Um, um, so here is um, Claude Monet's wife, um, uh, Camille, dressed in uh, kimono uh, with the fan, etc. And... Um, 
Well, you know, the kimono and the fan are culturally significant. They are instantly recognizable by a Japanese. Um, and this is being borrowed by the dominant culture, the European culture at the time. So, bingo, we have cultural misappropriation. And just to reinforce that, at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, I don't know what they were thinking about three, four years ago, they invited patrons to come in, dress in a kimono in front of that painting and have their photographs taken. And there was uproar. Um, so, um, you know, it definitely qualifies on all three counts. Culturally significant, immediately recognizable by the people from that culture, and it's a dominant culture basically playing with the things that identify uh, a minority culture at the time. So if we go to the next one... Um, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be nearly as much a misappropriation if the individual wearing the same outfit uh, was in fact Japanese. Oh, I don't, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, if it's your own culture, then that changes everything, obviously. But it's the borrowing, it's the um, assumption, adoption of somebody else's. So, you know, I don't wear Hawaiian shirts because I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I'm a Hawaiian, you know. So I'm playing with you there. You know? you, you'll, you'll, you'll change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, yes. Um, I've been told that, that, that Hawaiian shirts are not really Hawaiian. <laughs> um, I'll probably start a fire now. Um, uh, so um, somebody told me that they came from uh, cut up kimonos. So there you go. The, the, Hawaii is the perfect example of, of mixing of cultures, right? Um, um, what is the, the food that is developed here? Poke, you know, and, um, you know, a real kind of smorgasbord of, and it's great, right? As long as nobody's taking offense. So I'm trying to clarify what's okay, right? And what's what crosses the line? <clears throat> well, that, let's can we look at that for a minute about the offense part? Mm -hmm. Different strokes for different folks. Yeah. Some people would be offended by a given appropriation, and others would not. Yep. Um, and uh, a jury of of twelve, uh, you know, they could go this way, they could go that way. It, right. it would it certainly wouldn't be unanimous. Everybody would have a different. View right, of the, the word offense. Yep, uh, yep. Uh, people have got that got there before me. Uh, Jay, um, a philosopher, um, and then his name escapes me. Wilson, I believe, um, uh, has looked at that and uh, I've forgotten the exact terms he uses, but he describes uh, he, um, the kind of offense. You know that it has to be reasonable, and it has to be. Uh, it's not his term, but um, severe. I mean. Um, um, he admits himself, though, that um, they uh, raise the question of, well, just who defines reasonable and uh, severe, you know. So, you know, so if you answer one question and it brings up another one. Well, sure it does. And, and offense, you know, something being offensive, that is usually an emotional reaction, right. uh, or at least in part of an emotional reaction. So it's, it's hard to put, um, you know, an objective standard on that. It sounds like that uh, that great old case about pornography uh, that was decided by the Supreme Court in the fifties. Um, I, I can't define it, um, but but uh, what was the comment? I can't define it, but but I I know when it's there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know it when I see it. Right? Yes, yeah. I know it when I see it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, uh, I can believe that. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think that I'm, I'm, I joked with you earlier. I'm going to give you a test at the end to see whether you can, you know, um, whether you can, when you know it, recognize cultural misappropriation when you see it, right? And th I'm actually, this is a lesson, right? I'm, you know, I'm getting a free education. Here. So I'm going to see if I, if you learn or whether I failed to teach you. Right? So, on to the next image. Uh, um, yeah, so um, here we go. Um, uh, pretty offensive stuff if you come from either the cultures, you know, um, a, a culture that, well, Japan in particular, um, although the characters are Chinese, I mean, Zen, at least in that pronunciation, is, is, is Japanese, and then um, the Hindu culture um, on the right, and here, Western commercialism, basically trying to sell stuff on the back of um, culturally significant symbols, and they are instantly recognizable, they're not... Um, um, and it, it, again, it's the dominant culture because in those culture, cultures um, or in those countries, uh, Buddhists and Hindus are the minority. 
And uh, there was a backlash um, uh, for both. And um, um, certainly for the beer, which was taken off the market. Uh, I'm not sure about the, really? the shampoo, but, um, but, you know, I think that's a fairly clear example of why somebody would be offended. It's instantly recognizable. It is significant. And it's being used for, um, what's the word? Um, a kind of um, an unflattering purpose, right? Uh, mm. a, a base commercial purpose, right? And taking a religious symbol like that. Um, the swastika, right, is the classic example of that, right? Uh, a South Asian symbol that got completely subverted to the point now where lots of us can't look at that without going, yeah, that's not right. Uh, um, you know, so that's, that's uh, an egregious example of cultural misappropriation, right? Where they've turned something and completely inverted its, its meaning. It means light in its original context. Could hardly be more different, right? So um, it's right up there at one end of the spectrum of the worst kind of cultural misappropriation. Um, a sort of perversion of meaning. Um, on to the next one. Yeah, um, okay, this is um, the saga of Mike, Tyson, Titans, uh, Mike Tyson's face tattoo, right, which apparently seems to have come from um, traditional South Pacific tribal um, tattoo forms, and um, then it gets parodied in, in, in this dreadful film, The Hangover, um, which I have to admit, I think I did see the first one, I mean, to my shame. Um, um, and then um, there was a lawsuit. The tattoo artist who, who did the Tyson tattoo, um, and uh, Tyson appeared in the film, but it, um, the tattoo artist uh, tried to claim um, personal copyright over the tattoo and sued Warner Brothers. Um, I believe the lawsuit failed. Um, um, but it's, it seems to me I mean, first of all, the forms are culturally significant, they are recognizable, and this was a dominant culture, basically America, um, borrowing from, if not Maori, then South Pacific culture. And, and then, you know, if that isn't enough, um, you know, uh, the, the appropriation of, or misappropriation of their cultural form, then there's the insult being added to that of trying to profit from it and, and claim copyright over something that you took from um, from a culture without, without permission, which, which seemed to sort of double the insult. Um, it reminds me of the, um, the lawsuit between um, uh, Microsoft and Apple, uh, probably 30 years ago. Uh, you know the story that a lot of the technology for, for, the, for the Macintosh uh, came from the Xerox labs in Palo Alto, right? Um, and, um, and then um, Apple, i.e. Steve Jobs, trying to sue Windows or, or Microsoft for coming out with Windows, which they felt was too close to their operating system. And the argument in court, which actually succeeded, was, well, you know, if you went into a window and stole something without permission, and then I took it off you on the way out, who's wrong here? And it worked, you know. Uh, Apple lost the lawsuit. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I think those kind of examples uh, cover the whole gamut uh, from apparently innocuous, right? Um, you wouldn't even know that, you know, where, where a particular form had come from to, well, it's significant, but you wouldn't know, or it's not significant, or it's coming from a dominant culture who wouldn't be offended or have their identity undermined um, by, its, by its use. So now I have, um, when you're ready, Jay, I'm, I have my test ready for you to see if you. Uh... Okay, I just want to make a comment, though. Yeah. Um, there's a there's an element that I would build into that, mm -hmm. and that is uh, whether uh, there was a sacredness, if you will, about this particular design. And mm -hmm. to the extent there is a sacredness, um, you know, that, that heightens the possibility of misappropriation under this context. I'd agree, uh, absolutely. Um, I don't know enough about um, Maori culture, um, but they did object to the Tyson tattoo and they objected to the lawsuit, I mean, on mm. all sorts of grounds, you know. Um, so clearly they felt that, that these forms were significant enough and, and um, whether they use the term sacred, but um, for many, um, 
uh, uh, many of those tribal forms are, with a small s anyway, sacred. Um, yeah. they, they, they are very protective of that culture because it is a, an endangered minority. And so they're super, I mean, I, I believe some, some nurses in the UK um, did the hacker recently um, as a sort of jovial kind of, um, um, I don't know, light relief in the middle of the COVID. They were severely criticized by people from the Maori um, uh, community. Uh, mm, make, making even, fun sometimes is very unfair. Right. Yeah, but I am also reminded, Kevin, of a program that was conducted at the William S. Richardson School of Law, mm -hmm. probably ten or twelve years ago. I remember going to it, and it was uh, it was really right on this conversation. It was a, a study of whether mm, cultural misappropriation or appropriation, if you will, mm -hmm. um, of um, of uh, Hawaiian patterns like tapa pattern, right. top, top up patterns, you know, right. um, was actionable as a violation of some, an infringement, I mean, a legal infringement. I know you're not talking about legal infringement where you're talking about right. something other than legal infringement, but about whether it might be an infringement. And the problem was, I, I don't remember how it came out or who argued what. I, I don't think it was ever met with a, either a, a, an actionable lawsuit uh, or, or I mean, a successful lawsuit, right. or a change in the law. Um, but one of the problems with it was, well, who owns this? Right. The community owns it. I mean, and what community? Who is in the community? Let's assume you make a run at somebody for um, trying to characterize cultural misappropriation as an infringement, right. some kind of common law infringement, right. um, taking your property. Well, who gets who gets the award? Yeah. How do they share the the six dollar uh, verdict? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, this is an issue, and uh, there's an author, uh, uh, Susan Scafardi, I think I, I probably crucified her name, who looked at um, cultural um, misappropriation or appropriation from a legal stance um, back in like 2005, I believe, and uh, and she points out that that that, that what you've just described there that that whilst individuals and artists in particular can copyright their work, cultures can. And it's not that they shouldn't be able to, it's just that the law, well, there isn't a law yet. Um, that, no. You have I, to have an entity. I mean, if you went out and, and tried to copyright a Maori design, mm -hmm. um, what about all the other Maoris? You, you hold an, an mm -hmm. interest in this design and they don't, that yeah. doesn't seem right. Yep. Um, and, and so, you know, it's really, it's the same kind of thing. It's, it becomes property and, and, and doesn't there have to be some entity? So you say, yeah. well, okay, it's the Maui Cultural Association, a mm -hmm. nonprofit corporation yeah. uh, incorporated in New Zealand. Yep. Okay, well, um, who's a member of that? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and if I'm not a member, do I have any right to? So yeah, it's yeah. a whole question of property rights. Interesting. I mean, uh, I, um, yeah, and then there would be disputes over, well, we've got rival cultural, you know, somebody would think they could probably make a buck out of this and go, well, I'm going to set up my rival. So, you know, and then there'll be a lawsuit over well, the split of the, you know, I can see, I can foresee the, uh, the issue with that. But it is odd. I mean, I circle back to what I was describing your car, your non-existent car. Uh, or these uh, flashy car. Um, and, you know, the difference between a, a tangible um, object and a cultural form, which is intangible. And, and here we are at the other end, you know, the law can only deal with the physical. There needs to be physical property and there, uh, well, it, intellectual property is a thing, right? So, um, um, but now we're hearing, well, there needs to be one identifiable physical owner. You can't have a culture, which is a kind of um, uh, a non-tangible. But if you can have intellectual property, can you not have, um, you know, equally an intangible kind of entity, as you call it? Well, I, you know, I, I don't know. It could be that from then till now, or at some point in the way, along the way, um, some court has said, 
Well, um, this this is a class action. Right. And, and, and when you sue on behalf of a culture, you're, 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 actually, um, you're actually doing a class action and, and certified as a right. class action. And anyone right. in the class, and I suppose that would be blood quantum or who knows what, yeah. uh, would have a right to pursue that, that claim. I'm glad Maybe, of, I, I don't know the law. No, I'm glad one of us is a lawyer. We're making some progress here. You know. <laughs> Um, we, we have to make progress into the exam because we're almost out of time. Oh, okay. All right. Into the exam, into the box. I always like to take exams very quickly, you know. <laughs> All right. Uh, can we see this? Uh, okay. Um, two um, wonderfully poetic um, post uh, T-shirts, right? One, one Chinese characters. Um, the, one on, the Chinese character one um, is uh, uh, smite, uh, sorry, fighting elves, right? Um, I, I assume you can at least read the one on the right, even if you don't understand. I don't understand it either. Yeah, okay. Is uh, this cultural misappropriation or no? no. And you want to give us a reason? Or one, you doesn't guess, relate, one doesn't relate to the other, I'm sorry. Okay, but there's, a, a, according to the criteria, right, that I would specify, oh, could you go to the next one? Okay. I mean, some oh, yeah. to, yeah, oh, okay. okay. Um, um, so if we go back one, the reason, um, is that they're not culturally significant. They're meaningless phrases, right? Um, um, uh, so they're instantly recognizable, but, uh, and I've tested this on Chinese people, they go, well, it's kind of stupid, but it's not offensive, you know? It's, it's not culturally significant, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the defense would be, it's, it's stupid. Well, you have a poor sense of humor, but, you know, is, is that right. actionable? If, yeah. if they applied that test I mean, to litigation in general, a lot of I, cases would be I'd true. Been, I'd have been in jail a long time ago having a poor sense of humor. Was, was <laughs> um, next slide. Um, so here we have, you know, the, 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 the classic, uh, everything from, well, slightly less uh, offensive stuff when they're just trying to sell stuff to fascism. You know, and the militaries got involved as well, which really surprised me. Before the Second World War, the swastika was being used on Western um, military as a Western military insignia, which I had no idea of. You know, um, um, so what do you think? Um, misappropriation or not? Uh, yeah, it strikes me as it is misappropriation. And I think the uh, the people, wh where did you say it was in Myanmar? Uh, well, South Asia in general, yeah. South Asia in general have a good claim against the Nazis. They ought to sue them. All right, next. Uh, and uh, next ask for a lot of money, yeah. Right. Um, Problem is, uh, you know, you'd have to identify the Nazi organization today. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Probably, probably can. There are, there, are, there are actually organizations out there that are still using the swastika. Um, there you go. So the can, can you imagine an, an injunction against using it? That would be something else. That would be yeah. pretty interesting. To say nothing of the damages. Yeah. Um, all right. Ne next slide. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'm going to wait and see with that one. Um, what do you think? Um, I, I I can't see the one on the left very well. What what is that? It's a oh, Japanese. It's a, that's a Japanese uh, woman. Yeah, it's a Japanese print, and yeah. um, and then to lose the trek, um, de, uh, divan Japanese. Excuse my French. Well, there is this. This is, this is a resemblance for sure in terms of the the color, um, the color of the clothing. Um, but is it misappropriation? No, because you were it, Japanese. It, what do you uh, do? You think that you know? Would this be? Um, is it significant? Is it recognizable? Um, I don't think it's recognizable. Um, exactly. And I think that that Toulouse uh, Lautrec had had uh, he had his own style, and it was just an accident. Hmm. All right. Uh, well, um, next slide. Yeah, that was my conclusion. That you know. Most Japanese, unless they were told, would would not, uh, especially at that time, would not have said that that is remotely Japanese, right? It's I like, like them both, though. I I yeah. hang either one of them on my on my wall. Yeah, and I, and I think that's my you know that's my point. I suppose that uh, you know that kind of artistic um, borrowing, creative synthesis, uh, does no harm, and you know art in general profits from that, benefits from that. Sorry. Um, um, but um, they can coexist. 
Exactly. Right. Without There's anybody no, being offended. No harm, no fun. <laughs> Final slides, I think. Okay, that, we're, that's it? I think we got, I think that was it. Yep. Um, okay, well, I guess I get 100% on that or an A? You, did, you passed. I mean, you had the answer okay, okay, ahead of time. Right. So, you know, um, yeah. but no, that was good. So what's, well, what should we leave people with here? I mean, suppose, uh, just, to, just to put the cap on it, suppose we find um, that there is cultural misappropriation in art, architecture, design, what have you. Mm -hmm. Where does that take us? Do we stamp our feet or what? Uh, I think you've called a lawyer. Class action. <laughs> See, I'm on your side. You'd have to make a lot of calls to find one who could who would take take that. This is why I'm talking to you, Jay. I'm, I'm relying on you to be the guy. You know. Um, no, I I, I I look forward to the day when uh, you know we can well, we are having conversations about this kind of thing. You know, it matters. You know, and COVID puts everything into into the shade, of course, as it, as it rightly should. But uh, you know, um, these things did matter, and I'm I'm looking forward to the day when they matter again. Um, uh, you know, and we can we can talk about other things. But clearly, we're not out of the woods yet. But um, yeah, when we are, um, I'll be at your office um, with a class action lawsuit about um, some of this stuff. I'll, I'll 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 be sure to refer you to somebody who might help you. It would take me a while to figure that out. But or, uh, I don't know the lawyer. But let me let me let me offer this thought. Um, you know, there's an awful lot of infringement that goes on all the time. And that's infringement in a legal sense. Yeah. Uh, and that's because we live in a world of, um, of images that are easy to obtain mm -hmm. and easy to propagate. We live in a world, a flat world, Thomas Friedman's flat world, where everything is all meshed up. Yeah. Uh, and there are, there are positives and maybe there are negatives about that. I mean, for example, I, I hate to see the great Japanese culture be diffused uh, in any respect because I admire it so much. And, and then so for a lot of cultures. But the fact is that in a globalized society, in a flat world, um, people are going to emulate what they like. And it, it is usually a statement of uh, admiration that they emulate this sort of thing. And the people who, and the people who say, well, I'm offended by that. Um, I, I want recourse against you. I'm really ticked off that you took my design or my cultural, my cultural indicia. Uh, they should, they should uh, get a life. Well, um, I, I, I've met, you know, plenty of people would agree with you, but, but lots of people would, would disagree, you know, that, that, um, that this is a serious thing, a sort of uh, identity, uh, they would argue that it's not a flat world yet and why should we um, um, accelerate that you know um, do we all want to be homogenous you know um, or you know is it worth preserving just as we would preserve species preserve these these cultures and not have them um, I, I have to admit that there is a kind of a, almost an inevitability about some of this you know it's not whether we like it or not it's just gonna happen right uh, um, but I think it's a worthwhile discussion, you know, as to, as to know. I'm, I came into this um, really from a sort of, from the point of view of creativity, what is originality? And I touched on that a couple of weeks ago in talking about, right, you know, it's a, um, people would misunderstand if, if you had sources, somehow that makes you unoriginal. And to me, you know, bringing things together that previously existed, but in brand new combinations is creativity, is originality. So I, I, you know, I didn't uh, set out to look at appropriation per se, um, but I sort of stumbled into it um, because a lot of what Wright did, I would argue, well, for years and years and years, people didn't recognize it. So um, almost by default, then it, it wouldn't qualify as misappropriation because nobody actually recognized it as Japanese. People would say, well, you know, there's something Japanese about his work or whatever, but we can't quite pin it down. And, you know, I am a little bit too close to write, I suppose, but, but he's where I started on this um, and, and then was sort of interested in, in, well, if he's not guilty of cultural misappropriation in, in most cases with his architectural plans, then where does the line, where, where do you trip over into something that really is damaging? And that's how um, I, I got into this. So. Well, you're, you're, uh, you're a cultural 
appreciator person. And let me say that the, the real inquiry here, recognizing the, the coming homogeneity of the world, the real question is to recognize the influences in any work mm. and to respect them as influences, to appreciate them and mm. to appreciate the work itself as a combination of influences. And that is the, you know, to me, that is a very gratifying experience. So, yeah. Kevin, thank you so much for this discussion, provocative as it was. And I look forward to our next discussion uh, soon thereafter. Um, take, take care, be well, stay well, and we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. All right, great fun. Thanks, Yang.